Welcome everybody. Uh, glad you could come tonight. Uh, welcome to the May meeting of the nonprofit Plant-Based Nutrition Organization of Wisconsin, or but we call ourselves PB Now. I'm your host, Terry Lynch. Uh, the mission of our nonprofit group is to educate, inspire, and support each other on an evidence-backed, whole plant food-based nutritional path for health and improved quality of life. Our group is open to everyone, those plant-based and those just curious about it. It's meant to be a non-judgmental place to come for, get information, inspiration, and support. If you'd like more information about our group, our upcoming meeting dates, speakers and resources, or just to check out the videos of our past meetings, you can just Google us at PBNOW. As we do each time, can I see a show of hands, either by raising your hand or using the thumbs up icon um, on the Zoom panel at the bottom to show how many of you are currently uh, following the plant-based lifestyle? A lot of thumbs going up and a bunch of hands. I'd say that's probably about half of uh, what we've got here. That's great. As we mentioned at the beginning of each meeting, the evidence of the benefits of plant-based nutrition in improving health and quality of life for people of all ages as published in non-biased medical research is quite striking. Whether it's improving health through increased energy, weight loss, preventing slowing, stopping, or reversing problems like allergies, digestive problems, diabetes, heart disease, as we'll hear about tonight, in early dementia, or increasing our, <clears throat> our quality of life by helping us feel better quickly, by strengthening our immune system, increasing our endurance, improving our athletic performance, speeding recovery from exercise, reducing joint pain, clearing thinking, or reducing the physical, emotional, and financial side effects of the illnesses, drugs, and procedures often recommended to treat the conditions that plant-based nutrition can help us avoid, the research shows our bodies do a wonderful job of healing themselves if we stop damaging them daily with poor nutrition and start giving them the nutrition they need to heal and function optimally. It's truly remarkable. Now, let me tell you what's in store for you tonight. Uh, tonight, we'll hear from two speakers. I'll mention Dr. Liberman, who had been scheduled to speak tonight, is not going to be able to uh, join us. Um, he's actually out in Washington, D.C. and was unable to find uh, a spot to do this. Uh, first, we'll hear tonight from, um, uh, from a dietitian, registered dietitian, Joy Lenz. We'll talk about some summer eating tips and ideas. And after Joy, our featured speaker, Dr. Esselstyn, will begin at about 6.15 or 6.20 and follow his talk with some Q&A. Our program should end by 7.30. As a reminder, we have meetings on the second Thursday of the month. Next month, we'll be taking a summer, an early summer break, but we'll pick back up right away on July 14th. Once again, you can find out more information about our upcoming meetings on our website, uh, pbnow.org or just Google pbnow. Uh, if you register on our website, you receive email reminders of the events as they approach. A quick technical note uh, during the meeting, everyone but the speakers will be muted and we ask that you stay muted to avoid background noise and allow everyone to hear the speakers. We'll use the chat box for questions and participation when we reach those points. All right, here we go. Our first speaker was encouraged by her mother years ago to check out nutrition as a course of study. And she, and lo and behold, she loved it. She became a registered dietitian and since then has been helping people across the age and health spectrum to feel their best. She's the founder of Bring Joy to Your Kitchen, where she provides online group courses and weekly coaching to help people transition and succeed on a plant-based lifestyle. Joy and her plant-based husband, pediatrician internist and internist, Dr. Michael Lenz, have three school-aged children live just west of Milwaukee in Economoa. Tonight, she'll share some of her favorite plant-based summer 
salad ideas, and I've asked her to update us on her upcoming plant-based courses as well. I'm pleased to welcome registered dietitian, Joy Lenz. Joy? Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Um, I will kind of keep um, an eye on the chat box, so definitely use the chat box. And I'm going to be sharing my screen here in a moment, so I realize that my, the top of my head is being cut off. Uh, but anyways, definitely use the chat box. I want this to be as, as interactive as possible. All right, so it is May. It finally, we're getting some warmer weather, and I just wanted tonight to focus on the dishes and some plants and some things that we can take to the summer cookouts because finally I think we can have some cookouts on our mind and in our plans. So that's what I wanted to focus on tonight. And what I did then is I did create a little uh, PDF. So I did just put a link to it in the chat box. So later on you can uh, download that or email it to yourself or whatever you wanna do. Uh, but for right now, I'll share my screen and we can go through it. All right. So I got about 10 minutes here and I'll do the best I can. Yes. All right. Okay. So there we go. I'm gonna raise it up here a little bit. Okay, so yes, like you said, I'm a dietitian and I switched to a plant-based lifestyle and I'm feeling so much better since I did. So with this little handout here, what I'm, what I'm providing you tonight is three recipes and then another additional tip sheet, all right? So with this first one, this is an Italian chopped salad. And I made this for the first time a few months ago and I absolutely love it. Uh, tonight, my family ate it. Uh, I have it right here. And um, so that you can see some of the ingredients here. So it's romaine lettuce and then radicchio, red onion, celery or cucumbers, whatever like little crunchy thing you want. And then tomatoes. Uh, I also have some sun-dried tomatoes in here as well. And I use the sun-dried tomatoes that are dry because then they don't have all that added oil in them. And then a can of chickpeas and then those little pepperoncini peppers or uh, bell banana peppers, you can use also those as, um, and then some other optional things would be things like the bell peppers and the olives, all right? Uh, dressing then, okay? So I had just saved a little bit of the dressing and my husband um, was helping me clean up and he threw it out. So I'm like, oh no, I, so of course I don't have it here. Um, so this, if you do have a little bit of oil, that, that would be extra virgin olive oil. Otherwise, if you're avoiding oils, that's great as well. So you can just skip that. Um, and then the dressing had the red wine vinegar, a little bit of Dijon, uh, something a little, something to sweeten it up a little bit, kind of whatever you guys are using, and then some garlic and then some Italian seasoning. So all of that just gets whisked together and you make your very own very quick delicious salad dressing, all right? So what I would definitely recommend, and I'm sure you've learned with experience, is that you would not put that dressing on this salad before you go off to your cookout. Uh, I would put that on just only right before serving, all right? So this salad is tonight, all three of my kids ate it. It's very um, crowd pleasing is what I would say. So that's my first one. The second one, I'll keep going here, is uh, also another crowd favorite, all right? And so while I'm talking then too, what I'd like you guys to do is in the chat box, please write down uh, what salads you will bring to parties this summer. So I'm curious, these are just a few ideas that I'm giving you, but I'm curious which ones are you um, thinking that you will take, all right? So write that in the chat box while I'm talking. And so the, the standard black bean salad, I love, uh, I love the term when I came upon it for the first time, Texas caviar. Uh, and there's different variations. I think Texas caviar has more of an Italian dressing maybe. Um, but this one has the, the, the vinegar again and um, more of the Mexican kind of flavors, all right? So corn and black beans and then bell peppers and onions, tomatoes. Uh, the peppers, whichever one that you want to make it more spicy. And then, um, you know, avocado 
you may want to add avocado later at the party so it doesn't get kind of mushy. If you have other vegetables, you can certainly use other vegetables. Uh, cilantro would be my herb of choice, but I understand some people don't like cilantro, so that's okay and you can use something else. All right, so again, this one, a little bit of extra virgin olive oil or totally omit it, it's totally fine. Um, red wine vinegar and then a little sweetener and then um, this one has the lime juice then and some cumin. So this is super versatile. I love this because you can think about it and you can serve it alone. You can serve it over a bed of greens. You could serve it with potato wedges or even on top of a baked potato. Uh, you could stir in brown rice or um, the other day I had a big batch of farro and I put it right on top of my farro and that was really good and really filling. Um, or you can make little tacos with it, with tortillas. So, you know, the lots of variety and variation in this as well, all right? Uh, and then it's easy to just double the beans and double the corn if you need to make a bigger amount. All right, and then the third recipe here is more on that Asian citrus kind of side where um, I love to use edamame. So as you can see, my theme of having beans, uh, legumes in all these recipes, when you're taking them to a party, you, you want to, um, I want to know that I'm taking something that's filling in case there really isn't a lot of other options. All right. So the edamame, uh, carrots and cabbage, green onions and bell peppers. This one is so beautiful when you put it all together. Uh, I love to add maybe broccoli or tofu. I bake up tofu in my air fryer, um, you know, so much. The hemp seeds, mandarin oranges for a little bit of sweetness, and then two salad dressings down here below as well. So the one is a little bit easier and, um, or you can just really push the easy button and just get a good Asian balsamic vinegar and do that as well. So those are three salad dressings and then other ideas to take to cookouts in the summer even, all right? So I made this more at the holidays, but I think now in the summer, it would be super fun to take a plantary board, all right? So this is on the final page of my little tip sheet. I would just pick two or three fruits um, and then two or three veggies. And then you get um, like a board just kind of like I have pictured there you would get maybe two different crackers and then on my photo here I have um, a little cheese ball that is wrapped it's um, got little craisins and I believe pistachios so that little cheese ball was made out of cashews and um, and then I have a beet hummus as well as a little chocolate chia pudding so those are some things that I used on my little plantary board, all right? And then you just throw on some rosemary, some herbs, and it looks like a million bucks, and it won't be a million bucks, <laughs> all right? And then just some final little things here, um, the broccoli raisin salad. Like how do you, you know, you can take your traditional salads that you've been making maybe for a long time and just kind of update them now. So a broccoli raisin salad might have like a cashew and vinegar dressing. There was a recipe that I found at the eatingbird.com, eating bird food, sorry. And then the classic potato salad. If you go to the Forks Over Knives uh, website and search potato salad, there is a ton of them. And I have made several of them and I love them. Um, one in particular has horseradish. It's really good. And with um, purple potatoes and blue potatoes. And then uh, last but not least, the pasta salads. You can uh, make a, like a vegan pesto with different herbs, probably basil, pine nuts, garlic, lemon juice. So those are some examples there. And then just add different vegetables along with the pasta. And then if you want more filling, you certainly would add beans as well. So Minimalist Baker had a really easy vegan pesto, but you would want to omit the oil on that as well. So those are just some quick ideas that I have for you. And like I said, this, um, the link for this is now in the comments. 
All right. So, okay. I wanted a quick look and see what everybody is saying. Oh, where do you get the dry version of sun-dried tomatoes? So I shop at a pick and save Metro market and over by the produce, there's a rack and they are there kind of by pistachios. They're on a rack. Cowboy salsa. Yes. I love that's another term for that. Um, Yep, let's see, would you consider adding a whole grain to your salad? For sure, that's exactly what I do. Millet or um, black barley, yes, yes, for sure. They'll help you get satisfied. Like I said, I did farro yesterday. Beet and orange arugula salad, yes, awesome, yep. Um, yeah, those citrus dressings are so fun. All right, something with rice noodles, okay, yep. Yeah. Maybe an Asian one, the chickpea salad, chickpea of the sea, that's a, Popular one, yep, where you use the chickpeas instead of tuna. And, okay, um, explain the chopped salad. So um, I, I just like to generally chop up my salads a little smaller. I don't like to have big, huge chunks of lettuce. So I, there, there definitely is, um, it's a preference as to how much you want things chopped up. But uh, I generally like things chopped up um, smaller. And depending on what gadgets you have at home, um, you would maybe even want to chop it up even more. Sometimes I want it really chopped up and I'll throw it in my food processor and that really chops it up really little. Um, let's see. Okay. I'm hungry again. Yay. Good, 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 good. <laughs> okay. So Trader Joe's has sun-dried tomato products. Um, that is great currently. Okay. Thanks, Lori. And Smoke in the potatoes in a Weber grill and use them on a potato salad. Wow, that sounds amazing. Yep, so thanks everybody for those comments. And, um, and then before I leave, I just wanted to quick mention, um, like I said, I am a dietitian. I live out in Oconomowoc, but I do one-on-one -on -one counseling and I also have an eight week uh, course, online course. It's called Plant You, and uh, it's going to be starting up on June 5th, and it does have uh, live coaching. So every Tuesday night for eight weeks, then I meet on the Zoom with the group. So if that is something that you're interested in, uh, you can go to my website, bringjoytoyourkitchen.com, and I don't have it quite active yet right now, but I will try to have it active by tonight. All right. So that's an eight week course, like I said, uh, to help everybody transition to a plant based lifestyle. So it starts June 5th and at my website, um, bring joy to your kitchen.com. And I'm super honored to be here tonight with Dr. Esselstyn. So thank you so much, Terry, for letting me join you. And I'm so excited for the next hour. Joy, thank you so much. Just doing a little technical work here. That those, uh, I'm very hungry now. <laughs> so it's yeah, gonna, it's gonna be tough to uh, to wait. But uh, yeah, I love uh, my wife makes that cowboy the cowboy or yes. Texas one and calls it cowboy caviar. So it's, yes. it's the yes. Texas caviar and the cowboy this and that. So yep. thanks so much. Yes. Yes. All right, everybody. Um, our featured speaker tonight has saved literally thousands of lives, many with his scalpel, more with his research, and even more yet with his tireless advocacy to give people the information they need to take control of their own health. He received his undergraduate degree from Yale, his medical degree from Western Reserve University. As an Olympian, he earned a gold medal pulling the number six or on the victorious U.S. rowing team. As an army surgeon in Vietnam, he was awarded the Bronze Star. For over 35 years, he practiced as a highly skilled surgeon, clinician, and researcher at Cleveland Clinic, consistently rated one of the top hospitals in the world. He chaired the clinic's breast cancer task force and headed its section of thyroid and parathyroid surgery. He served as president of the clinic staff and as a member of its board of governors. He's a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and a past president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. If that weren't enough, 
As a researcher, his scientific publications number over 150. In 1995, he published his benchmark long-term nutritional research on the number one killer of men and women in the US, coronary artery disease, or more commonly known as heart disease. In, this, in his pioneering study, severely ill patients were able to arrest and reverse their coronary artery, artery disease through diet. The study was updated at 12 years and reviewed beyond 20 years, making it one of the longest longitudinal studies of its type. The studies detailed in his excellent uh, book, which was a New York Times bestseller, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. His awards are many, and I'm just going to list a few here. 2005, he became the first recipient of the Benjamin Spock Award for Compassion in Medicine. 2009, he received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from the Cleveland Clinic Alumni Association. In 2013, Yale University awarded him the Lifetime of Leadership Award. 2015, he received the Plantrician Project Luminary Award. And in 2016, he was given the American College of Lifestyle Medicine Lifestyle Achievement or Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Esselstyn currently directs the Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Reversal Program, named after him, at the Cleveland Clinic's Wellness Clinic. He is also a dedicated family man. He and his wife, Anne, have four children and a castle of grandchildren. And both he and Anne have followed a whole food whole plant food guide for over 35 years. I'm thrilled to welcome a true giant in his field, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Dr. Esselstyn? Let's get this uh, set up here. I'm not sure that... Um, All right, go, go ahead. You were muted. Oh, there you go. The there you are, Dr. Esselstyn. Yeah, good, Terry, thank you for those kind words. It's an absolute delight to be back uh, in uh, Wisconsin, even if it's, a, if it's virtual. But uh, I think we're gonna try to see if we can't, for those who are involved tonight and uh, their friends and relatives, see if we can't have them learn how to absolutely make themselves heart attack proof. Now, if you were a cardiac surgeon, and you decided that you were going to uh, hang out your shingle uh, in Okinawa, rural China, the Papa Highlands, Central Africa, the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico. Forget it. You better plan on selling pencils. Why? They don't have cardiovascular disease. Why? Because they all thrive on whole food plant-based nutrition. Now, I want you to know that this is the oldest slide in my presentation tonight. And I took this in 1968 when I was leaving Vietnam, having spent a year there as a combat surgeon. And it is to remind me to remind the audience that when we autopsy our young GIs, average age 20, 80% uh, of them uh, in, the, in, this, in the Korean conflict already had gross evidence of coronary artery disease that you could see without a microscope. Not enough yet for their clinical, any clinical events, but here they were at that young age, already with coronary disease. Now that study was repeated 45 years later, this time looking at young women and men between the ages of 17 and 34 who had died of accidents, homicides, and suicides. Now the disease is ubiquitous. Think of it. By the time you graduate from high school, you get a diploma, but you also get the foundation for heart disease. And is it any wonder if we keep uh, if we keep if we keep eating that way uh, that by the time we're in our late 40s and early 50s, then uh, we have this tsunami of cardiovascular disease becoming symptomatic that we've had we've had really for 25 years. I mean, you have to understand that. When you get a heart attack, it doesn't, it, that doesn't develop and, and occur in just one week or two weeks. You work hard in those preceding decades to, to give this problem. Uh, can I ask Terry at this time, uh, it, 
Can you hear my uh, Can you hear my voice? Certainly can. Mm -hmm. and, and the phone. And the, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Anne, would you please take this right away? Now, we had a chance to really get a further understanding of this in World War II. You may recall in World War II, maybe you don't recall, <laughs> depending on the age of the audience. But in World War II, the Axis powers of Germany overran the low countries of Holland and Belgium, and they occupied Denmark and Norway. And it was characteristic that the Germans took away their livestock for their troops. So their cattle, their sheep, their goats, their pigs, their chickens, their turkeys were now suddenly gone. And now we have these Western European countries becoming plant-based. And it was Dr. Strom and Jansen who in uh, 1951, publishing in England's leading medical journal, they reviewed the deaths from heart attack and stroke in Norway during this time frame. So let's do this together. Let's focus on the left-hand side of this slide. And you can see in 1927, the deaths in Norway from heart attack and stroke were going up. 1930, going up, 35, 19, going up, 1939, in comes the Germans. Whoop, down goes the deaths from heart attack and stroke. Whoop, down goes the deaths from heart attack and stroke in 1941. Who knew these Germans were these great public health educators? But look what happened in 1945. The death of Adolf Hitler, the cessation of hostilities in the European theater. Back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, back comes the strokes, and back comes the heart attack. Not a good plan, but it really was historically very significant. But sadly, we just didn't get it. Now, <clears throat> you're obviously looking here at two blood vessels, two arteries. And the one on the right, you're probably saying, boy, when that small opening finally closes off, there'll be a heart attack. Well, interestingly enough, only about 10% of heart attacks come uh, from this type of blockage. This has taken years to develop. And what has happened is that the body has begun to make its own bypass. We call those collaterals. And if, the, if you do an angiogram of this, uh, vessel with this blockage, that is to say, you inject dye into the coronary artery, you will see these small collaterals carrying dye past this blockage, so that not in, infrequently, you'll see when that is completely blocked off 100%, there's still no heart attacks. Why? Because the collaterals are enough to sustain the downstream heart muscle viability from these small collaterals, obviously not enough to ever make it work normally, but it's fascinating how the body does this. And uh, yes, this type of blockage will cause chest pain, angina, and perhaps shortness of breath, but not always a heart attack, 10%. Shortly, I'm gonna share with you how 90% of heart attacks occur. But I want you to note on the artery on the left, which is normal, if you look carefully, and the innermost lining of that artery, you will see a little dark line. That little dark line is a very, very important set of molecules called the endothelium. And we're gonna to get to that a, a lot more shortly. Now, the first thing that happens when you're eating the milkshake, the cheeseburger, uh, and the pizza, cellular elements within your bloodstream begin to get sticky. Your endothelium, lining the artery gets sticky. Your white blood cells get sticky. Your LDL cholesterol gets sticky. Your platelets get sticky. And we're gonna come back to that in a moment. But this happens to be a slide from Peter Libby from Harvard, who, and even though I went to Yale, we often find wonderful things from Harvard. Here, the blue is where the blood is flowing. What separates the blue from the artery wall are those tiny little cells, the endothelial cells. They're flat 
and purple here. Now to make some sense of this, let's work this together, starting again from the upper left portion of the slide, where you will so see uh, in the flowing blood, Peter Libby has painted your LDL cholesterol orange, but remember because of what you've eaten, everything has gotten sticky. So your sticky LDL cholesterol bumps up against your sticky endothelium, identifies a crack, a fissure, a, a per, uh, an opening, and it now migrates into the sub endothelial compartment. And there, because of again, the food you're eating and the free radicals that come from the food you're eating, Peter Libby has now started to paint your LDL cholesterol yellow to indicate that it is a small, hard, dense, oxidized LDL cholesterol molecule, which the subendothelial space does not like and calls for our SWAT team, which are painted blue here and migrate into the subendothelial space and be behave like a Pac-Man, a macrophage. And what it does is it gradually, as it goes across the artery, it gobbles up, gobbles up, gobbles up all those small, hard, dense LDL cholesterol particles until it gets all the way over to the right, where we in medicine do what we do so often, we change the name. Once that SWAT team molecule, that macrophage is now completely filled up with these small, hard, dense LDL molecules, and we call it a foam cell. And the foam cell is truly the Darth Vader <clears throat> of this sequence of events. Why? Because the, the foam cell elaborates, that is to say, it produces these nasty metalloproteinases like stromelicin, elastase, collagenase, myeloperoxidase. What is it that they do that's so bad? Well, they progressively, in, let's go to the figure on the left of this group of three, those metalloproteinases from the foam cell gradually will erode, will thin out the cap over the plaque till it gets so thin in the upper portion of the plaque that you will see in this figure on the left, an early little crack has developed. And that is a seminal moment because you have now ruptured your plaque. And what happens is that rupture widens and we now have the extravasation of or the oozing out of, if you will, of plaque content into the flowing blood where it activates our clotting factors like platelets. And you can see in the middle figure now, a clot begins to form. And that clot is in and of itself self-propagating. So we go all the way over to the figure on the right. And you can see that the clot now is completely blocking 100% of all of the artery and what's happening now is all the downstream heart muscle now is suddenly deprived of oxygen and nutrients and it starts to die. There's no time for collaterals to develop in just a few minutes. Now, that's 90% of our heart attacks. And if I do my job correctly tonight, hopefully every one of you and your friends and relatives can make themselves heart attack proof. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna do that by actually changing your biochemistry. How are you gonna do that? We're gonna do that with food. We're not gonna do it with a pill. We're not gonna do it with a stent. We're not gonna do it with bypass surgery. We're gonna do it with food and we're gonna change your biochemistry. When we change your biochemistry, we are gonna to totally interrupt the cascade of events that I've just shared with you. There's not gonna be any migration of the LDL cholesterol into the subendothelial space. There's not gonna be a SWAT team. There's not gonna be any Darth Vader, the foam cell. There's not going to be any metalloproteinases. You are not going to thin out the cap over the plaque. You do this correctly, you're going to strengthen the cap over the plaque. And if you strengthen the cap over the plaque, it cannot rupture. And if it cannot rupture, you have made yourself heart attack proof. And before we end tonight, I should be able to prove to you that that can happen in three weeks. Forget the x-ray in this slide. I want you to focus on the artist's depiction of the artery, where you can see that half of it is filled with plaque and the other half is still open. And the part that is open, you can see those nice little endothelial cells they are painted sort of white here. And really it was up until uh, 
up until I guess 1980 that we used we in medicine used to think of these endothelial cells as these cute little red bricks that were lining these wonderful pipes of ours. But that all changed in 1980 when Dr. Fershkot, working in his lab in Brooklyn, was able to take the largest blood vessel in the rodent, the aorta, and he would make this sort of elliptical spiral staircase cut right through the artery, the aorta, right through the endothelium. Then he would immerse it in a bath of saline and it would constrict. But one day he decided no cut, no injury to the endothelium. He immersed it, it dilated. Whoa, did it again with another one? It dilated. Now suddenly the race was on globally. What was the EDRF that Dr. Fershkot had discovered? Endothelial derived relaxation factor. Now, thank heavens that term was with us only eight years because in 1988, Dr. Fershkot, Dr. Louis Narrow, and Dr. Murad discovered that the EDRF was a gas, nitric oxide. And 10 years later in 1998, those three men received the Nobel prize for discovering nitric oxide. Now, what is it about nitric oxide that makes it worthy of getting a Nobel Prize? Because of its remarkable functions, which include one, nitric oxide is responsible for the salvation, the preservation, and the protection of all of our blood vessels, all right? Now, <clears throat> Nitric oxide is going to keep all the cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thick and stiff or inflamed, protect us from getting high blood pressure, hypertension. Number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages or plaques. So literally everybody on the planet earth, whether they're from London, Berlin, Chicago, New York, if they have cardiovascular disease, it is because by now in the previous decades, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised and turned their endothelial system into an absolute train wreck that they no longer had enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages or plaque. However, the good news is this, it's not a malignancy. And once you can get patients to understand that never again are they to pass through their lips a single morsel that is gonna further injure an already train wrecked endothelium, because then the endothelium will recover and often make enough nitric oxide so that we can see disease reversal. Now, the second th thing that, that happens is usually about this point in my presentation. The audience is sort of saying to themselves, Kelly, I wonder what my level of nitric oxide is. But we really don't yet have a handy way in the office to measure that unless you've got a $35,000 machine from Israel. Uh, however, uh, the, the key is, is, is to how it's measured uh, in a research setting is you take an ultrasound probe and you place the ultrasound probe over your brachial artery at the elbow. And there you measure the diameter of the brachial artery. Then the next thing you do is for five minutes, you encircle the upper arm with a blood pressure cuff that you inflate above systolic blood pressure so that for five minutes, there's absolutely zero blood throw uh, going to your forearm and hand. And uh, I've had that done. It's not exactly habit forming. <laughs> and then you release the cuff and immediately again, take the ultrasound probe and measure the new diameter of the brachial artery at the elbow. And in the normal individual, it'll be increased by 30% because of the outpouring 
of nitric oxide in, while that tourniquet was in place for five minutes. Now, the next thing that was really quite interesting and quite powerful was Dr. Robert Vogel, chairman of cardiology at the University of Maryland, took a group of healthy young subjects to a certain fast food restaurant that is characterized by arches, which are golden. Half of the group had cornflakes, the brachial artery tourniquet test in them, normal. The group that had the hash browns and sausage Within 120 minutes after ingesting that meal, they could not dilate the artery. That meal had so trashed, so injured their endothelial cells that they were unable to make enough nitric oxide to dilate the artery. However, being young, uh, that's a little uh, re rehearsal in the back. You know, there's always some excitement when you're making a a presentation and you think you've solved everything. <laughs> All right, as, as the old Chinese proverb goes, nothing is forever. All right. <clears throat> so that group who had the hash browns and sausage could not dilate the artery because of the injury to the uh, endothelial cells. But being young, as they followed them into the late afternoon or early evening, they began to recover. All right, now, just think of it, the next morning for breakfast, these young, healthy people, probably gonna have what? Scrambled eggs and bacon. And lunchtime, they'll probably have white bread with cold cuts and mayonnaise. And dinner time, how about a baked potato with sour cream, lamb chops, vegetables soaked in butter, ranch dressing on the salad, and ice cream for dessert. Here in the good old USA, starting in our childhood, all day long, dawn to dusk, we are hammering away and injuring our endothelial cells as no great surprise that as we live into our 40s and 50s, we see this, as I said earlier, this tsunami of cardiovascular disease. Now, a quick review of what we've just talked about. The functions of nitric oxide, it prevents stickiness, strongest vasodilator, prevents arterial thickening, prevents blockages, prevents smooth muscle migration into the plaque in the artery and can destroy Darth Vader, the foam cells that make those nasty metalloproteinases. Now, here we see four wonderful defense mechanisms that the body has. We only have time this evening to talk about the endothelial cell, but I want you to really rest assured that every single one of the four of these is going to be absolutely optimized when you are utilizing whole food, plant-based nutrition. All right, let's go to the, where the rubber hits the road. What about a study? Well, the, this is the first of two studies that I did. And there were 23 men. We had nothing against women. In our second study, we had more women. And uh, the key here was to see if I couldn't get them to eat foods uh, that would not injure the endothelium. What are they? The foods that injure are, I didn't want a drop of oil, all right? Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a chip, oil in salad dressing, not a drop of oil. Also, nothing with a animal protein, no meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, or eggs. I do not like dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt, or sugar. And we want to avoid caffeinated coffee. Decaf, okay. Caffeinated coffee, studies show it can injure endothelial function. All right. Now, some have said that the reason, or I have said, I guess, that the <laughs> The reason our program working with patients can be so powerful in halting and reversing this disease is that nobody else is as mean as I am. And by that, by that I mean, uh, if you begin to cut corners, somebody says, well, Dr. Esselstyn is the, my anniversary. Why can't I uh, break the rules a little bit? And if it's your anniversary, then it's the 4th of July, then it's Labor Day, then it's Thanksgiving then it's Christmas, 
And there is a chapter in my book entitled Moderation Kills. So we succeed when their patients get attention to detail, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Here, for example, for those of you who are nervous about oil, you're looking at a peer-reviewed scientific article. Olive, soybean, and palm oil intake have a similar acute detrimental effect over the endothelial function in healthy young subjects. Pretty clear, pretty powerful. Now, I want to take a moment, explain a little bit of some work done by uh, Stan, Stan Hazen at our, at our clinic. And uh, Stan was particularly interested in lecithin and carnitine, which are molecules that are found in all these animal foods because these are the foods that omnivores consume. And Stan found that omnivores will contain in their microbiome, in their, back, in their gut, they contain bacteria, which are capable of converting lecithin and carnitine into TMA, trimethylamine. And trimethylamine is rapidly oxidized by your liver to trimethylamine oxide. And trimethylamine oxide will injure your blood vessels. So here is the schematic, and you can see lecithin and carnitine metabolized by the gut bacteria of an omnivore, resulting in the formation of TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, which gives vascular disease. But one of the things that was so striking that Stan Hazen found out is when he took persons who were absolutely, totally 100% plant-based, gave them a lamp chop, measured in their blood for TMAO, no, not there or very, very minimal. Why? Because persons who are totally plant-based do not possess in their gut or their microbiome, they do not possess bacteria that are able to convert lecithin and carnitine into TMAO. Pretty good argument if you're in a tussle with somebody who happens to be keto or paleo. Now, I do take one the uh, exception to anything that has to do with cardiology on this slide, because it was such a remarkable event in October of 2015, when the World Health Organization at its meeting, imagine this, representatives from countries all over the world came to an agreement that the carcinogenicity of red and processed meat was equivalent to that of smoking cigarettes. Finally, the word is out. Pretty powerful. All right. Going on with our study, what are you gonna eat? We said what they couldn't eat. What are you gonna eat? You're gonna eat these whole grains, W-H-O-L-E, for your cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels. 101 different types of legumes, lentils, and beans, all these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, and some fruit. Now, it's important to share with us, you how I changed our program about uh, a decade ago, 10 years ago. I made a modification and that was in, in lieu of respect for the knowledge that we learned of the fact that the endothelial production of nitric oxide is age dependent. You never heard of a boy or a girl at age eight having a heart attack, right? No, they have nitric oxide coming out of their ears. But by the time they're age 50, beautifully healthy, they have 50% of the nitric oxide they had when they were age 25. And by the time you're 80, you've lost 70%. So what we tried to do to modify the program a decade ago was to further enhance, further enhance the endothelial production of nitric oxide. And at the same time, most importantly, take advantage of the newer research that shows us that mankind has an alternate pathway for making additional nitric oxide, which I'm gonna share with you now. I need to have my patients <clears throat> with heart disease <clears throat> chew, not smoothies, not juicing, but I need them to chew a green leafy vegetable six times a day, roughly the size of half of your fist after it has first been steamed five and a half to six minutes so it's nice and tender. And then you must anoint it 
with several drops of either a rice or balsamic vinegar. Why? Because research has shown us that the acetic acid from those vinegars can enhance the function of nitric oxide synthase, which is the enzyme within the endothelial cell responsible for making nitric oxide. So you're gonna chew this alongside your breakfast cereal, again, as a mid-morning snack, again, with your lunch and sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, dinner time, five, and of course, I adore it when you have that, that evening snack of arugula or kale. Now, all right, at this point, what you're gonna know is that the second benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable, you are going to stimulate your bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cell, okay? What do the endothelial progenitor cells do? The endothelial progenitor cells replace our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. The third benefit and most important of all of chewing the green leafy vegetable, when you are chewing a green leafy vegetable, you are chewing a green nitrate. As you chew the green nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. And those bacteria are going to reduce the nitrate that you're chewing to a nitrite. Once you swallow the nitrite, it is now your own gastric acid, which is going to further reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide, which can enter your nitric oxide pool. So think about it what you're doing with minimal expense, no hideous side effects, literally all day long, dawn to dusk, morning to night, you are absolutely restoring nitric oxide. The, the molecule, which the very deficiency of which has given you this disease in the first place. Now there's a caveat to this. Toothpaste with fluoride, public drinking water with fluoride or mouthwash will injure the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. And I do not like antacids because antacids will reduce your gastric acidity and you will be unable, you'll be unable to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. Okay, no oil. All right, now I wanna share with you some angiograms of disease reversal. These were angiograms were reviewed, reviewed in triplicate in the Cleveland Clinic and Geography Core Laboratory. So when I give you a certain percentage of disease reversal, I know that it's accurate. This happens to be a 67 year old retired pediatrician. You're looking at the left anterior descending coronary artery. And from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right, this was described as a 10% improvement. On this next one, this is in a actual uh, a 58 year old factory worker uh, and we're looking at the uh, circumflex artery to the back of the heart. And from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right, it was a 20% improvement. Now this happened to be a 54 year old security guard. We're looking at the right coronary artery. And from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right, that was described as a 30% improvement. This is Dr. Joe Crow, who appears in the the first chapter of my book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And at age 44, in 1996, Joe uh, began to get chest pain. Cholesterol was 156. He was not a smoker, did not have high blood pressure. He was not diabetic. He exercised regularly, no family history. In October of 96, cardiology worked him up could find nothing. A month later in the third week of November of 96, he finished his surgical schedule and sat down to write post-operative orders when suddenly the elephant was sitting on his chest, pain in his left jaw, shoulder, left elbow. He was having a heart attack. He was whipped down to the cath lab. They start the catheterization. He had a cardiac arrest. They resuscitated him, finished the catheterization. One more cardiac arrest resuscitate, stabilizes back up to the floors. And then three days later, he's stable and discharged, but very depressed. 
Now, the reason he was very depressed was at the time of his angiogram, when they looked at his left anterior descending, the entire lower one third, which is bracketed here by a yellow bracket, the entire lower one third was moth eaten and diseased over too long a segment to simply ram in a stent after stent. And it was uh, too far down the artery to have bypass surgery. So he was depressed, they couldn't do much for him. So two weeks after his heart attack, uh, my wife and I and, and had Joe, uh, Joe and his wife out for supper. Joe, come on, look, you've been eating this horrible Western diet. You've got the typical Western disease. We've got 10 years of data. Why don't you think about going plant-based? Okay, yes, he said, I'll, uh, I'm gonna give it a shot, but I'm not gonna take any of those statin drugs. I don't trust them. Fine, that's your call, not a problem. Well, <clears throat> Joe became the absolute personification of commitment to whole food plant-based nutrition. And over the next two and a half years, his total cholesterol plummeted, his LDL cholesterol went from 98 to 38. And then he had two and a half years after his heart attack, he had another angiogram. Now up in the surgical office areas, our doors are three doors apart. So at noontime on the day that I knew earlier in the morning, he'd had his follow-up angiogram, I opened the door and there he was sitting behind his desk. Joe, I understand yet <laughs> you had the follow-up angiogram. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Mind sharing with me. How did it come out? He got up from the desk, came around, put his arms around me and said, I think, I think we're doing okay. I said, well, uh, how about any chance that I could see the uh, angiogram? And he said, sure. Now, that's pretty exciting. When the plaque is young and made up of cholesterol and fat and inflammation, the body can do a wonderful job of reversing it, providing you uh, have the patient dot the I's and cross the T's as I've discussed. However, uh, when it's an older patient and they've had the plaque for decades and the plaque is made up of fibrosis and scar and calcification, the likelihood of it going away is more modest, but before the evening's over, I wanna show you how even those patients can get back to full activity without restriction. And uh, this next one, again, is a younger man from Florida. Derek was 45 years old when he had his heart attack. And at the time of his heart attack, you can see that this is a branch of his obtuse marginal, which is a branch of the circumflex, which goes to the back of the heart. But he had multiple other blockages and his cardiologist advised him to have heart surgery, yeah. bypass. And uh, the patient said, no, I'm reading this book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, and I'm gonna try to, try to do it with diet. And the cardiologist said, uh, that never works. Uh, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna get any better. But a mere year later, after following the book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, he uh, had another angiogram. And what was 80% with this arrow, the same lesion is now 40% blockage. And at this point, he transitioned to a different cardiologist, but the other cardiologist was also quite curious. So after another year and a half, and uh, this time, January of 2020, he had his third angiogram and it was all gone. Now, this really does bring up a rather significant point. Why is it? that every patient with cardiovascular disease is not offered the option of whole food plant-based nutrition. Because when you're doing that, you're actually treating the causation of the illness. And, and when you treat these lesions with pills and stents and bypass surgery, you're not treating the causation of the illness. Ever hear of somebody who had a first stent, second stent, third stent? I have one patient who came to see me who had had 51 stents. Now, it's, I think it's really unfortunate because we've known for 100 years that there were multiple cultures on the planet Earth where cardiovascular disease is virtually non-existent. Why is it when the American Heart Association was formed in 1924, 
why didn't somebody say, I think we ought to bring that whole food plant-based nutrition of these other cultures, we ought to bring that to the United States. We still haven't done that. Extremely unfortunate. All right, now, uh, in those 18 patients that stayed with us for the full 12 years, I wanted to know in the eight years prior to coming into our study, while they were in the hands of expert cardiologists, I wanted to know how many episodes of disease progression had they experienced. And these are 49 events scattered across these 18 patients in the categories that you see listed here. However, once they came into our uh, program, over the next 12 years, 17 of those 18 had no further events. Yes, we did have one little sheep. After six years, wandered from the flock, <laughs> got into the lamb chops, French fries, glazed donuts, more angina, had a bypass. <clears throat> now he's back with the flock, but proves the point that I'm trying to share with you. Now, as excited as I was about this study, this first study, boy, did we get hammered. Dr. Esselstyn, that's a small study. Dr. Esselstyn, it wasn't prospective or randomized. Dr. Esselstyn, that's a pretty tough diet. What makes you think you can do that with a larger group of patients and get similar results? So we did. And this was that. The first one was published in, uh, in 1995. The second one is 2014. Not 18 patients. This time it was 198 patients. Uh, uh, actually, it was 200 patients. Two were lost to follow up. So of, of the 198, 177 patients were adherent to the diet over close to four years, 3.75 years. 21 patients were not. And so we were uh, the, in the adherent group, because it is a significant lifestyle change. We found that 89.3, almost 90% of the patients were adherent. You know, it's interesting. I've often just speculated. If, if I were to take uh, our diet to Okinawa, the Okinawans would look at me and say, well, you finally caught on. We've been doing this for 500 years. <laughs> and the, really the, the foods are delicious and there are thousands of wonderful menus available today. But how, how do you get 90 patients to make this lifestyle change? Because it's to get your patients to make a lifestyle change for many physicians is a, is a challenge. And why, why we get 90%, I think is because of the following. Right now, presently, I conduct a monthly uh, intensive uh, counseling seminar. It's not for a 10 or 15 uh, minute office visit without the spouse. We do this, of course, virtually now, but you limit, usually limit it per month to 18 or 20 patients, always with their spouse, or may, they may have their grandparents on the couch with them. But it's a five and a half hour program. I know very few cardiologists that spend five and a half hours with their patients. Usually it's uh, something like 12 or, 12 or 10 or 12 minutes. And uh, these patients, uh, since I guess I'm a little old fashioned, my secretary will give me a list of who is coming, usually about 10 days or two weeks beforehand so that I can call personally every one of the patients and visit with them to get my arms around their story. And at the same time, provide them with an opportunity to ask questions of me so that coming to the seminar, we have a strong platform from which we can all move forward. Uh, how do they do? Well, of those who are adherent over this uh, 3.75 year follow-up, one patient, while he was in vacationing in China, totally forgot all the rules, eating off the economy, all that salt. He had a tendency to have some hypertension and he got a small cerebellar stroke from which he recovered. But on the other hand, 21 patients who were non-adherent, 62% had disease progression. So I wanted to compare our results with some of the well-known cardiology studies that are out there. And it's interesting that if we look at uh, for example, the, the box on the right is the Lyon diet heart study from France. 
where at the end of four years, 25% had experienced heart attack, stroke, or death. One box to the left of that, the Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York, the natural history of coronary disease. At the end of four years, 20.4%. And one more on the left, Bill Bowden's Courage study, at the end of four years, 19%. Now we go to the left of that, and you have our study. Six tenths of a percent, this is one patient. That's over a 30 fold difference between our results and those other results that you see. What accounts for that difference? The difference is that we are treating the causation of the illness. And ever since the days of Hippocrates, there's been a basic covenant of trust that whenever possible, the caregiver will share with the patient what is the causation of the illness. But sadly today in cardiovascular medicine, that is not being done. Cardiovascular medicine is using pills, stents, and bypasses, none of which have one single solitary thing whatsoever to do with the causation of the illness. So if we compare the, the mechanical interventions with the diet, there's no mortality with the diet. There's no, more, there's no morbidity with the diet. There's no added expense because you've got to eat. And the benefits do nothing but improve with time. And think about it, that patients who have had a heart attack literally are walking around with the sword of Damocles hanging over their head, wondering, when does the other shoe fall? When do I get my second heart attack? Nonsense. You never get another heart attack. No, you absolutely are going to live in a way that you're going to strengthen the plaque over the cap. That you're going to strengthen the cap over your plaque and it cannot rupture and you've made yourself heart attack proof. Now, here's an interesting Pulse volume on the left. In a 54 year old gentleman, and I was so concerned about his heart, but crossing the skyway to my office, he had to stop five times because of claudication or pain in his right calf muscle. And, uh, I, but I was so focused on his heart, I forgot all about his leg. Until 10 months into the study, he said, Dr. Esselstyn, do you recall when I started Seeing you, I had to stop five times crossing the skyway to your office. Yeah. He said, you know, the last month they got to be <clears throat> four times, three times, two times. He said, I don't stop anymore. The pain is gone. Okay, Don, back you go to the vascular lab. And they repeated his pulse volume. And in 10 months, as you can see on the right, it had doubled. We now had, within just a few months of starting this study, we now had irrefutable rock solid science that food and food alone could absolutely halt and reverse cardiovascular disease. And somebody's gonna say, well, wait a minute. What about the statin drugs? Well, wait a minute. Um, this is the second patient I'm showing you who improved without any statins. One was Dr. Crow and the other is Don. And you're gonna uh, worry about statins because remember, well, Joe refused statins. In 1986, what you're looking at here with this pulse volume, we didn't have any statins then. They weren't, they weren't invented. Here's another. This is a high school chemistry teacher, age 78, who in his retirement and with his wife, they love to enter these square dance contests. But it was during the fast square dance that he was getting bilateral calf pain. And he saw these vascular surgeons who got the images that you see here. And he didn't like the big operation that they were proposing for him and came to, <clears throat> came to see us and said, Dr. Esselstyn, if I choose your method, how long will it take to get rid of the calf pain? I said, I looked at him with great wisdom in my face. And I said, probably about, uh, hmm, and, 10 or 11 months. Three months later, I got a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. The pain is gone. Now, I don't know quite what the market for television is in all of you who might be in the audience, but I know that in Cleveland, when if you're watching a <clears throat> sporting event or if you're watching a mystery, just before the advertisement comes on, you will hear the mellifluous tones of the announcer say something like, when the moment is right, will you be ready? Now, we know 
that the penile artery is really quite tiny in comparison to the coronary artery to the heart. So not infrequently before somebody comes down with heart disease, they'll find that they uh, are unable to, shall we say, raise the flag. However, uh, all is not lost. Not infrequently, 10 or 11 months after I've counseled somebody, I'll get a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, yes, this is Mr. So-and-so. Good, nice to hear your voice. Yeah, doc, I really thought I ought to give you a call because recently something has come up and I'm wondering if I don't owe you another check. All right, now what you're looking at here is a PET rubidium diperidimol scan, a PET scan. This is in a 60-year-old downtown Cleveland stockbroker. And in a PET scan, on the left, you will see if it is orange or yellow, that's really a reasonably good perfusion with blood. But you'll notice the green area and the area on the uh, image on the left. And that green area is ischemia, which is a fancy medical word for lacking its normal blood supply. So I counseled him on the day that he had that PET scan on the left. 10 days later, his cholesterol was down to 137 from uh, 250 something. And then we repeated at three weeks, we repeated the PET scan. Now you can see that area that was green is all back to yellow and uh, orange. Now, we don't, you don't wash out a, a plaque blockage. You don't just wash it out in, uh, in three weeks. So what was going on here? Why was this happening? So I want you to see, here is a picture of the heart without any muscle. All just, you see the beautiful outline of the vessels. And you can see these three main arteries that ride on the surface of the heart before they dive into the heart muscle. You see that the three main ones are the right coronary artery, the left anterior descending, and the circumflex. Now, also you will see once it dives into the uh, muscle, there are now, it divides into these literally thousands and thousands of beautifully interconnected uh, vessels nourishing the heart muscle, which as you know, from the day you're born until the day you die, it never, never stops. Now, I called to Rodriguez, who is the chairman of cardiovascular pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. And I asked him, Ron, how often do you, because he dissects 200 hearts a year from the deceased. I said, how often do you ever see a blockage or plaque building up in the artery once it has dived into the heart muscle? His answer, never. Now I knew where we were. I knew what was happening because when I first see these heart patients, their endothelial cells are so beaten down. They are hardly making any nitric oxide, the great blood vessel dilator. And by now your endothelial cells have become your enemy. How is that? Because they're so beaten down, they are now making two molecules, endothelin and thromboxane. What do they do? Endothelin and thromboxane are what we call vasoconstrictors. They tend to narrow the artery. So think about it. Look at that image that's in front of you now. Those thousands and thousands of interconnected arteries are all pinched, squeezed. So what, seems, what is so exciting when you treat these patients when suddenly they stop every single morsel that is injuring their endothelial cells, within four, six, eight, or 10 days, they start making more nitric oxide, the great vessel dilator, and they stop making endothelin and thromboxane, the vasoconstrictor, bingo, where they used to walk two blocks and they start to get chest pressure and chest pain, suddenly they now can walk four blocks, six blocks, or eight blocks. I've got them hooked. It's working. They know that what they're doing is curing their disease. All right. Now, just to summarize the measures of cardiovascular disease reversal we've talked about, the coronary angiogram we've shown you. It happens with stress test. I've shown you the PET scan. 
it doesn't only happen with reversing the blood vessels in the heart and the leg and those that go to the head. And we've talked about pulse volume and the reversal of the symptoms of angina, claudication, and erectile dysfunction. Now, I like to always close up by sharing with you the A building at the Cleveland Clinic, where for many years on the eighth, eighth floor, I worked as a surgeon. But I also think it's fun for those of you who aren't here uh, to know what the trees look like in Cleveland in, <laughs> in, in February. All right. I, after I retired from surgery, I was rehired by the clinic and the Wellness Institute to uh, deal with patients with cardiovascular disease. And at the Wellness Institute, the uh, morale is quite high, but the budget is a little bit more modest. And uh, one thing I've learned uh, some 61 years after leaving medical school, yeah, no question that brains are important, but nothing, nothing, nothing is as important as persistence, persistence, persistence when you know you're right. As best exemplified by this young damsel in 1939 in Life Magazine, trying to learn how to do the splits, but it is tough. However, she stuck with it, stuck with it. And sure enough, the other day, I believe it was uh, somewhere in uh, Racine, Wisconsin. They spotted her and she got it right. All right. Thank you. Um, well, Dr. Esselstyn, thank you so much. Uh, right. that was an outstanding presentation. And uh, the way you deliver it is uh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, as good, good luck, Camille. As a reminder to everybody, our next monthly meeting will be uh, in July, July 14th. We're taking June off. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you'd like to receive notice of this or our upcoming PB Now events that are not currently on our list, you can register on our website at pbnow.org by googling PB or by googling PB Now and, and clicking on the Learn More button on our homepage. Uh, if you'd like to check out our past meetings, just go to the video library section on our website. Hit the button there and you can go back and watch entire talks or just go to parts of each talk that you may have a particular interest in. Thank you again, Dr. Esselstyn and Joy for sharing your valuable time and knowledge with us tonight. Thanks, Terry. Come back, Camille. Bye-bye. Take care.